my message tonight, God's intention for this midnight hour, God's intention. Oh, King Jesus, we love you. Be exalted, O oh Lord. Oh, we adore your name. Jesus, touch us with fire. Touch us with yourself. We've sung, be glorified. Now, Lord, do it. God, burn the word into our hearts. My King, Lord Jesus, be exalted tonight. We love you. Amen. God's intention for this midnight hour. Do you remember the, the hippies and the flower children? An entire generation of searching, restless, hungry young people. Do you remember when they massed in Woodstock and in huge rock concerts all over the America? And the pervading questions of the time were, who am I? Why am I here? What's the purpose of all? And when no one could answer them intelligently, many of them dropped out. But you see, they were asking questions that God's children should have been asking themselves. These were questions the Holy Spirit was trying to bring to us. But we were so busy, so occupied with ourselves and with health and wealth, we didn't even hear what the Spirit's saying, so we had to take the question to the hippies and the dropouts because we weren't even in tune. I believe the Holy Spirit of God's been trying desperately for 20 years to get a message into the church. They heard because they were hungry. But now it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to listen to the Holy Spirit. And he that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the church. Here are the questions the Spirit has to get through to you and me tonight. Why are you here? What is God's intention for you in this crisis hour? Do you really know what God expects of you in these last times? What is God's one great final purpose for our lives? What is His purpose? And how sad today that so few men and women of God can answer that question. There's only a remnant left today who understand God's purpose for his children in the last days. A majority of ministers today are sounding a trumpet that's making uncertain sounds. And the uncertainty in the pulpit has spread a cloud of uncertainty in the congregation. And multitudes of Christians who profess to be serving a mighty God still live in bondage and despair. There's absolute ruin in some churches today. Everywhere you look, there is ruin, and you know it. There's an emphasis on certain doctrinal issues by evangelists and teachers, and it only adds to the confusion. And many hungry people today are asking, who is right? Just what is God's purpose for today? What is the Lord's intention for me and for His church? Is it miracles? Is it casting out demons, discipleship, church growth? We hear so much that is confusing. What is God's intention? What's His real purpose for the last hour? And I believe that God has had but one great intention for his people ever since the cross. It will not change. It has not changed. There has been but one purpose from the beginning. There will be but one purpose till Christ returns. God's intention has to do with understanding the mystery of the gospel that was first revealed to the apostle Paul. And it's a mystery no longer according to the apostle. Paul said, by revelation, God made known to me the mystery which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed by the Spirit. And he has come to make known to all men what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now the mystery revealed, and this is what you've got to understand, we've got to understand it before we go any further. The mystery that has been revealed through Paul and to the church of all ages. Christ's body is still here on earth. Christ's body is still here on earth. The head is in heaven, which is Christ, but the rest of his body is right here on earth. We who love Jesus and serve him represent his visible parts, that which men can see of Christ on earth. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones, and he is the head of the body of the church. Now God's full intention for this last hour can be summed up in one sentence. Listen to it. Since we are Christ's body on earth, God's intention is that every member become a true expression of who Jesus is. That you, that I, 
that everyone that calls themselves by his name become a true, holy expression of who Christ is on this earth. Now, God intends that we express a complete, full Christ so that any sinner on the face of the earth can look at you and can look at me and see Christ as surely as he were walking on the flesh on this earth, in the flesh. The world, the sinner has to be able to look at you and see the same fullness, the same intention of pleasing God as they saw in Christ as he walked in the flesh. Because we are his flesh and his bone. We are the visible body of Christ on earth. The mystery unfolded is that Christ's body is still visible here on earth. And it's you and it's me. We are to appropriate so much of him, of his glory, his completeness. The world will see us, see in us the hope, the answers to all their needs. And if you and I cannot live out Christ, we have no right to preach him. If we are not a true expression of who he is, we have no right to talk of him. It's not enough either to just know Christ. We've got to be a full expression of who he is. You have got to look at everything in your life. I've got to look at everything in my life. In this light. Does this represent. This is what I'm doing. This is what I am. Does this represent who Christ is? Is this what I want the sinner to see and know of him? Would Christ in his physical body. Walk into an X-rated theater? Would he linger around a pornography counter? Would Christ abuse his body in any way? Would he indulge in adultery and fornication or drinking? Would he cheat? Would he tell dirty, dirty stories? Would he lie? Would he live a lie and then attempt to preach the truth? Would he try to spread the light when there was a pocket of darkness in his own life? Would he tell others not to commit adultery and then in secret do it himself? You see, we've got to keep before our eyes this one great intention of God that his body would always reflect who Christ is. Now, if you set your heart tonight on becoming a true expression to the world of who Jesus is, you're going to stir the very wrath of hell. You can build all the colleges you want. You can raise up orphanages and retreats and build churches all to God's glory, quote, unquote. You can go out and evangelize and you can give your body to be burned at the stake because you see, the devil will not trouble a miracle worker or a moralist, but Satan will not leave you alone once you set your heart on truly expressing the holiness and the righteousness of Jesus Christ to the world and showing the world by your life who he is. You see, when you discover God's intention and you begin to know who you are, his body, and when you get into the center of that purpose, when you know you're called to be as he was on the earth, you're going to be the direct target of everything in hell. Would you build an orphanage over in Africa? Would you go to the Amazon to preach the gospel? Would you go to the American slums and give your body to human need? Would you go to college campuses in Iran and preach for Christ and sell out to God? That's very commendable. That's fine. But it's not God's first intention for you in this last day. Because if you are not a true expression of who Jesus is, everything you do is human. It's works and it'll burn at the judgment. Because the scripture said in the last days, many will come saying, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out devils? Did we not heal the sick? Did we not do many things in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you work when you could. I never knew you. And conversely, you never knew me. And when Peter stood before Christ and said, I don't know the man, he wasn't lying. He spent three years with him and never knew him. Who is the one who has vision? We talk about a man, a woman having vision, a man of God who has vision. Is that the one who builds a great church, who has the big budget, who speaks to the largest TV crowds? No, the one with vision is the one who reflects the glory of Christ, who's had a vision, eternal vision of who he is. In Christ, sitting in heavenly places, and who is able to reflect the glory of Jesus.
because God will not sponsor anything that does not reflect Christ. Whatever is born out of relationship to Jesus is the only thing. The only thing that he sponsors is that which comes out of the mind of Christ. And I don't see much in America today that is a true expression of who Jesus is. There's so much of ego, bragging, competition, struggle for recognition, but so little of Jesus Christ. I switch on the television set and I watch the Christian gospel programming and my heart grows sick. The pitiful appeals for money, the spectacular expensive sets, the endless small talk. And I cry and I say, oh God, is this the best expression to the world we can give of who Jesus is? Raising money for a choo-choo train. The time is not far off when things are going to start unraveling and coming apart. The daily news will become terribly frightening. The economy will yet go into complete disarray. You watch the end of this year and see what happens. The nations of this world are going to tremble with fear. We're about to enter the most ominous times in history. And everything the scripture says it can be shaken is going to be shaken. And what's going to count then? When everything around you is crumbling, you're going to see men of God stand in the midst of their projects and weep and howl. Massive building programs are going to sit idle. Cobwebs and bats will fill the temples. And the monuments of self-achievement are going to haunt the people who built them. Those who chased after health and wealth and prosperity are going to be empty and desolate because they have no inner strength to face the horrors that are falling. They have no history with God. Those who took the things of God so lightly who never broke away from the world in its spirit. Those who are unwilling to forsake the old world in their old ways. They're going to have nothing to see them through the final days. There's only going to be one thing that matters then. Do I know Jesus Christ intimately? Am I an expression of him on this, in this dark hour? Will I be one of the few who will witness to this crazy world that Christ is above it all? Will I be his shining light when it gets dark and cold? Now there's something in your heart that responds to this call to be an expression of him. And you're yearning to be that expression. There are two things that you've got to understand tonight. One part is Christ and one part is yours and mine. I want to discuss them with you. First of all, this is his part. We cannot be an expression of Christ until we're convinced that everything is clear between God and us. You've got to once and for all understand what Christ did at the cross. And this generation lacks the theology of the cross of Jesus Christ and its victory. The entire charismatic movement. The upper room has overshadowed the cross. We've developed a Christless Pentecost. Without a theology of the cross and its victory. We don't even know that God's heart was satisfied by what Jesus did, by what he did. Because at the cross, Jesus Christ forever took away the thing that offended God's eye about me. He once and for all satisfied the heart of God. And if God is satisfied with me, I'm going to be satisfied. He took away that which was in the eye of God, giving us a right from that day on to be in his presence and to be accepted before God. There is not a single thing that stands between the child of God and the Father. Not one thing now that stands between. You don't dare go another step tonight until you fully understand the efficacy of the cross of Jesus Christ's blood. That you and I are fully pardoned. God does not have to be appeased. He's been fully appeased if that's the word you want to use. He's been fully satisfied. The cross, get it? The cross has cleared us before the eyes of God. We are clear. You may forget that, but God doesn't. The veil was torn that allowed us entrance. It was God saying, you are now accepted. Come boldly to my throne. You are now mine in the beloved. You are accepted in the beloved. You and I can't even pay for our sins because we don't even know the extent of the offense. We didn't know what the offense was. We don't even know how we grieve God. How can you pay for an offense you don't even know? 
the extent of. Jesus Christ knew the extent of the distance between us and the cross and God. And he closed the distance. He brought us to the heart of God. And you don't know anything about the heart of God until you look at the prodigal son. And you see it not as a story of a sinner coming back. But it's the story of the joy of the heart of God. Of those who come to him before he even comes. He's there rejoicing. He brings him into the house and puts a ring on his finger and a robe on his back. And he accepts him and he has a feast. That story is the rejoicing of the heart of God. It's a reflection of what is in the heart of God. The love for his children. The love for those that are under the blood of Jesus Christ. We have lacked the knowledge of the security that we have under the blood. This is one issue that's got to be settled once and for all. You cannot allow a cloud between you and the Father. But you say, David, my heart condemns me. I still sin. I've done things I believe have grieved the Holy Spirit. I'm unworthy. There are times that heaven seemed brass. But the Bible said, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. All you have to do is repudiate your sin to hate it, confess it. You've got to believe that in Him forgiveness of sins is preached. Do you preach that and then not believe it for yourself? That in Him forgiveness of sins is preached. Hallelujah. Now here's where most Christians fail, especially young people. They live with unnecessary fear and bondage because they don't understand the glory and the victory of the cross. They are clear in God's eyes, but they don't know it. God is completely satisfied, totally satisfied by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the way has been cleared into God's presence. There's nothing blocking access now except our fears and our lack of knowledge. And won't it be a shame that so many of us stand before God and we had so much that was offered and we didn't enter in because of our lack of knowledge? We couldn't believe it was so glorious, it was so beautiful that God said, I will not impute your sins against you. They're forgiven, they're under the blood, and it was too good to believe. And we lived under constant fear and condemnation, getting saved and resaved and filled and refilled, and never understanding the glory of the cross that God has been satisfied. Hallelujah. When the veil was rent in two, it was not just that God allowed us to come in, but God could go out. He goes out immediately to a sinner called Saul. The veil was rent not to just let us in, but to let the love of God flow. And he goes to Saul immediately say, Saul, Saul, come home. Hallelujah. How incredible. We offend God. We create this distance between us and Him. And yet He is so anxious to clear us in His own eyes. He sends His own Son, provides His own sacrifice to clear the way back. He judges sin. The offense is removed. And now God says, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. You can't face the world and tell you're in that glory. Until you have that peace and the glory of sins forgiven that God is not trying to impute sins to you now. He's trying to reconcile you to himself. He didn't have to be reconciled. He was never not reconciled to the world. He has always been reconciled to the world, but now he was out to have us reconciled to him. He himself removed the distance. Hallelujah. What is there in us that attracted the grace of Jesus Christ? Was there some marvelous grace in us? Was there some beauty or goodness or strength? Was there some kind of potential in us that attracted the grace of God through Christ? No. It's misery that attracts grace. It's need that attracts grace. You find that all through the New Testament, that our greatest attraction to God is that we are poor, helpless creatures in need. What attracted Jesus to the Syrophoenician woman? What attracted him to the blind and to the infirm and the widows and the fatherless? What they all had in common was helplessness. What is it that attracts the grace of God in me and in you tonight? 
It's our helpless condition exemplified by the palsied man. And they came unto Jesus bringing one sick of the palsy. And take a good look at that man because he represents the helplessness of this generation, the helplessness of you and me having not one iota of strength or power. This palsied man can't even bring himself to Christ. You look at him trembling and weak and helpless. He's a prisoner to his bed. That's you and me before we understand this concept of deliverance through the cross. Jesus stands before this helpless man that's let down through the roof to him. And he didn't even mention his physical condition. First, the Lord was going to clear him before God's eyes. He would clear him before he heals him. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. You have to be accepted before you're delivered. Accepted before you're healed. And you have to know that you're accepted before you step out. You know what a beautiful picture of the love of God in Jesus Christ. He's a helpless man. He's too overwhelmed by his infirmity to even whimper. He can't even muster a confession. He has nothing to offer Christ. He's too weak. You see, the scripture said, It's not of works, lest any man should boast, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. It's not something that you and I have done. It's something that he is doing. Hallelujah. We're his workmanship. The Pharisees, with all their good works and their boasting, never did attract the grace of God. It was J.B. Stoney who said, The more parade, the less depth. The more parade. Look at the ministries in America today and judge it that way. The more show, the more parade, the less depth. But see how the weakness of man attracts his sympathy and his grace. You show me a person, you show me a child of God struggling with some hated besetting sin. Someone who's crushed beneath a load of guilt and despair. Hating the sin but feeling helpless and weak. Now I'll show you one who is the object of the abundant grace of Jesus Christ. Because where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Are you struggling? Oh, you're an object of His grace. It's our helplessness, our need that attracts grace. Hallelujah. Satan will come against you in this struggle. He'll suggest to you that God is mad at you. That you have no right into God's presence. He'll throw Old Testament concepts at you that have no right to be even thought of under the blood. He'll say that wrath and judgment's at the door. And I want you to know those are lies. All lies. All you have to do is look up to the Lamb of God and in your utter helplessness you hear these comforting words, Son, daughter, thy sins be forgiven thee. Hallelujah. Then you stand by faith on the finished work of the cross from that moment on. Let me show you something now. Through faith in Jesus Christ, your sins are under the blood. You live on the other side of the veil. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places. You're accepted in the Beloved. You are one with Christ and the Father. God's wrath against your sin has been satisfied. You have been given an inheritance. You are now more than a conqueror. You are now living and moving in the Spirit. There's a bloodline between you and Satan. Your accuser has been cast down and put to open shame. You are filled with the fullness of Christ. You have a power in you to meet everything having to do with life and godliness. You are the apple of his eye and the hollow of his hands. Purged from your iniquity. Renewed in your mind. You are reconciled, justified, sanctified, made ready as a bride. Translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You are made an heir of all things in Christ Jesus. You are no longer under condemnation. Because there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Christ abides in you. He reveals himself to you. And no height, no depth, no principality, no power, not man, not angels, not things on earth, not things in heaven can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You are feeding on Christ the manna from heaven. You're living in Zion in God's presence. He is your friend. He's your priest. He's your advocate. He's your Lord. He's your guide. What more do you want? And do you believe those things are true? Do you believe he said it? 
Do you believe that God made these promises to weak and helpless creatures such as we? Do you believe this treasures in earthen vessels? Are you forgiven? Are you clear in the sight of God? Have you accepted your acceptance? Do you believe while you're sitting here right now that you're fully accepted in the sight of God and nothing stands between you and Him and that you have an open heaven and you can pray for a spirit of revelation and knowledge in the things of Christ? Yes. And you can become a true expression of who Jesus is only as you take your place at the right hand of the Father, truly accepted, all the hindrances removed, not by you, not by anything you can do, not by promises you make, not by what you feel, but what Christ has done. There's a four-letter word the church has never understood. It's called done, D-O-N-E. Do you know that you can love Jesus and still be miserable because you don't know you're accepted? The most miserable people I meet in America, those who truly love the Lord with all their heart, but they've never entered into their acceptance before Christ. They've never entered into the glory of the cross of Jesus Christ. I don't want to be just forgiven. I want to be free. Hallelujah. Secondly, and this is your part and mine. He's done his part. It's done. It's finished. We are accepted in his sight. And oh, that's the blessedness that David was talking about of the man who knows that God is no longer imputing sins against him. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Here's your part. To become a true expression of Christ, you must take up your bed and walk. That's our part. The palsied man was forgiven and cleared in God's eye, but he was still a prisoner. He was relieved of all of his sins, but he was still impotent. He knew Christ as relief, but he didn't know him as resource. Now, come on now. This is where the majority of the church of Jesus Christ is, and this is where the entire charismatic movement seems to be right now. They know Christ as relief. My sins are forgiven. They're under the blood, but they've never known his resource. They've never been able to take up the bed and walk. It's not enough to be a forgiven cripple or a relieved prisoner. There's something you've got to do. Jesus said, is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. I say unto thee, the sick of the palsy, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. In other words, they go home and practice it in your home first. Go to your house. That man gets up out of that bed, but he did not get up out of that bed in his own strength. Christ imparted a supernatural strength to him because without Christ we can do nothing. We know it is the power of the Holy Spirit. And Christ was actually saying to this man, and he says it to you and me, I'm going to make you an example of my power over sin. You're going to become strongest where you were weakest. The thing that made you a prisoner, you will pick up and carry. You will overcome the very thing that held you down. You'll become strongest at your weakest point. A spiritual cripple who has a controversy at the center, who still has a cloud between him and God, who still lives with secret sin, cannot be a full expression of who Christ is. Now, every one of us in this room tonight knows what our weakness is. You know what the weakness is by the way God deals with you and by what convicts you. We know where we're most vulnerable. And Satan will come to you and suggest that one day that weakness will overcome you and cast you down and you'll lose everything. But that's not so. By His glorious power, God can make us strongest at our weakest point. That's what the scripture means by his strength being made perfect in our weakness. The man that was told to steal no more was made strong in that weakest point because God said, I'm not only going to make him not steal anymore. I'm going to give him a job so that he can become a giver. I'm going to take a, I'm going to take this taker. I'm going to make him a giver. He's going to become strongest at his weakest point. He once stole and now he's going to work and he's going to give. God will take you at your weakest point to show His glory to the whole world. He'll make you strong at that point and that should be your desire. 
and your faith in God's power to accomplish that in your life. You say, I want to be expression of Christ, but there's something hindering you now. And you know it. The Spirit's convicted you of besetting sin, a weakness, an intercontroversy that's still unresolved. But that hindrance you know must go. The prison doors have been opened. You've been forgiven, but you can't stay in that bed. You can't go about as a cripple. You've been in that bed long enough. You've been palsied by sin long enough. What in the world will the Lord do to get us out of that dominion of sin? How does he get us out of bed? He said he will give us a power to overcome. And we talk about this power as being something mysterious, but it's really not. Now listen closely, please. Let me try to explain as I see it. You and I are engrafted as a vine into Christ. Isn't that correct? We're as a branch into this vine who is Jesus Christ. All right, the very same power that enabled him to fulfill the will of God on earth is the very same power that enables us the very same spirit that quickened him and raised him is not another spirit that comes on us. It's the self same spirit. Couldn't you imagine the Holy Spirit going into that tomb and shaking, trembling that body and bringing life? That's the same, same spirit that raises and quickens us. The same place that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father is where you and I are seated. Scripture says, no man has seen God and lived. And Isaiah said, when King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. But that's the night Isaiah died. The message is, see God and die. And when you really see Him, you'll die to this world. you become detached. And the more attached you become to Jesus Christ, the less de attached you are to this world. You become detached to material things when you become totally attached to the throne. How do we get, how do we know our sins are forgiven? You stand here tonight and you say, we believe the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. How do you know that? It's by faith. You take that by faith. And when you take it by faith, there's a witness and you go your way with peace of mind. How do you know you have power? It is not by some outward expression. This is by faith and faith alone. You've got to believe that what God said is true, that when the Spirit of God came on you, he gave you power over all the forces of hell. Here's one preacher who will never ever accept the fact that a Christian can be possessed of a demon. How in the world can you live beyond the veil and a demon cross the veil? How can you be in the hall of his hand and a demon sit in the hall of his hand? How can you be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and have a devil sitting behind you or beside you? How can the devil cross a bloodline? No, 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 no in a thousand years, no, no. No, no, no. Don't ever let that come to you. Oh, I reject that in the name of the Lord. There is no scripture for that in the Bible. There's no scripture. I have the anointing on this. The blood of Jesus Christ. Satan cometh, Jesus said, has nothing in me. Unless you can say that, look the world in the eye. Never be afraid of the devil again in your life. And you're not to be focused on your sins anymore. You're to be focused on the right hand of the Father. Where you're seated in Jesus Christ. Not focused on sins, but the cross and the victory won there. Hallelujah. This palsied man gets up and walks and carries his bed. And that's a type of the believer who's in mastery over his sin. And what a, an expression of Christ this man was. What hope he gave to all the sick and the affirm and those who were burdened by sin. Didn't he give hope to everybody that saw that palsied man work here in his bed, walk? Isn't that what God's after today? He's not seeking for anything else but overcomers. Now listen. I'm convinced that the Lord Jesus is looking for people who will be such an expression of himself that they can show an evil generation how Christ completely delivers from the dominion of sin. That sinners could see Christians who live above the lust and plays of this world. They could see men who love their wives and they're faithful. The wives who don't cheat but they're good mothers and keepers at home. Young people and students who practice purity and separation from everything that defiles. Let me tell you how I feel. We've had enough colleges named after famous evangelists. We've had enough fastest growing churches in the world. We've had enough busy Christians doing exploits. We've had enough gospel radio and television. Because if radio and television was ever going to do it, we've had 50 years to do it. And with all that, the less people knowing Christ and serving in fullness than any other generation. 
We've had enough of crusades and concerts and outreaches. We've had enough about abortion and moralism. We've had more than enough of plans and projects and programs and seminars and books and records and tapes, magazines and newsletters. But we don't have enough Christians who truly express who the Lord is. There are very few that can that sinners can point to and say, there goes a Christian who really expresses to me who Jesus is. If I ever come to Christ, that's the kind I want to be. There goes one who has nothing to sell, nothing to promote, nothing to prove, but Christ, risen and glorified. There stands a man, there stands a woman who shines with the beauty and simplicity of Jesus Christ as Lord. There's one who has reality. There's something in him and her I can't deny. That's Christ. And shouldn't that be the goal of your life and mine? If that's God's intention, shouldn't that be ours? That we would represent Christ in his fullness and completeness. And when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I'm going to be judged on one criterion alone. David, how did you express me to the world? What did your life say to the world about who Christ was? Did you show forth Christ through defilement and compromise and shamefulness? Could the sinner see an overcoming Christ in you? Or did you show them nothing of the fullness, the joy, and the victory of Christ the Lord? You're going to be judged on how you've represented Him, what kind of an expression you've been of Jesus Christ the Lord. That's awesome. You're going to stand before the Lord and brag how many souls you've won? Lord, I, I got 200 souls last year. You're going to stand before him, pastor, and tell him that you built one of the biggest churches in America? You're going to tell him how many stations you're on? And I'm not putting that down. You're going to tell him what kind of crusade you started? What kind of moral victories you've won? How many people you've preached to? You see, God doesn't care so much about what you've done, but what you've become. That's the greatest thing the Lord's ever shown me. He's not, cons he's not interested in my winning all the world for him, but winning all of me for him. Hmm. Have you ever, has there ever been a day when there have been more works, more projects, more programs, and so few living in union with Christ as today? Before I close tonight, I want to list to you for you some of the things that will help you become the full expression of Jesus Christ. I'm going to list about 11. Don't write them down, please, because I want your good ear and I want your eye right this way. I'm going to go too fast for you to write. First of all, listen close and give me your good ear now. Christ shed blood washes you completely before the eyes of a holy God. Do you believe that? Christ's blood washes you completely before the eyes of a holy God. Number two, everything that could rise up against you and condemn you has been removed. Do you believe that? What's it been removed by? The sacrifice of Jesus. Third, God has never lost his satisfaction in what Christ did, and he's never going to lose his satisfaction in me because I'm in him. Do you believe that? Do you think God can ever be dissatisfied with what Christ has done? Then how could he ever be dissatisfied with me because I'm in him? For through his cross, Christ has removed everything that stood between me and him, and nothing can ever separate me again. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. Do you believe that? Here it is. Number five, his divine power has given to you, he's given you his divine power more surely than he gave it to the man with the palsy. He gave his power, Christ's power, was given to the man with the palsy. He's given that to you if by faith you would accept it. Six, God has seen your weakness, your helplessness, and he says to you, I'm going to snap it, I'm going to crush it, I'm going to overpower it, I'm going to do everything necessary to put away and make you superior to one thing that crippled you, the bed you laid in, you're going to carry. And I've got what I call a cookie jar theology. What does the parent do when the little child keeps stealing the cookies and gets spanked and spanked, the little child still climbs up? What's the parent do? He puts the cookie jar out of reach. 
Simple as that. There comes a time. You say, I can't handle my sin, Lord. And you love him. Your heart goes out to him. The Lord says, I'm going to take it. I'm going to crush it. I'm going to put the cookie jar out of reach. I'm going to take that thing out of your life complete. I'm going to put a million miles away from you. I'm going to make you strong at this point. Right here now. Not that you'll still be struggling for the cookies. I'm going to move the cookie jar. When I move the cookie jar, I'm going to take the desire for cookies away from you. God's going to make us stronger at that point. Hallelujah. Well, you still here? Number seven, his strength is going to be applied where you are the weakest. You'll become strong at that point. Number eight, Christ's one great desire for you is that he himself will shine through you, making you a beautiful expression to the whole world of who he is. God will not support anything that is not an expression of him anymore. Number nine, we must live now totally dependent on Christ. Do you remember the good Samaritan? What did he do? He put the wounded man on his own beast. And that's the hardest thing God has to do. Get us off our legs onto the beast. We like the oil and wine poured in, but we want to walk our own way to the end. Get it? He put him on his own beast. You're going to walk on his back. He's going to carry you. You're not going to walk on your own legs. And the most important thing God ever taught me to get me off my own legs. Number 10, there's only one choice you and I have and not two. And that choice is communion above service. There was a time I got all my delight out of service. Now I get it out of communion. And the man who delights in service will work and work until he gets burned out. And the God will create a crisis in his life or allow one to be created that information won't get him out of. He has to have revelation. God in his love. And the, past, the young man who preached last night brought that out so clearly. He does it in so many lives. Sometimes after 20, 30 years, some of you are having it done to you right now. Do you remember... Remember what I said, there's only one choice, there are not two, there's only one, there's no alternative, it's communion, and communion is simply a common mind with the Lord, a common mind with the Lord, that you are seated in heavenly places, and it's there that you get the mind of Christ, then you come down to this world, and you minister as coming from a heavenly place, you come as a heavenly man, or a heavenly woman, detached from this world, totally in the mind of Christ, so that what you do, God can support the Bible said, if, if, it, if it said Mary chose the better part, that would mean that there were two parts, uh, better and best. No, the Bible says Mary has chosen the good part. There's only one. That's the good. That's the communion. No other way. There were no two. It doesn't say she chose the better part. She chose the good part, the only part, communion. Number 11, and here's the most important. If we are his bride and he's coming back soon, Shouldn't the greatest object of our lives be affection? Are you in the bride? Is the bridegroom coming back? Then what should be our object? Power alone? Or should it be love? Affection. Affection. If you love me, you'll obey me. I'm going to close with a personal word. I don't like to do this often, but I want to show you something about his presence. I'll tell you something. I started preaching when I was 14. And about three years ago, God shut me down. Really shut me down. And it's, it's almost shameful that a man, after 25 years of preaching, has to say to you, you know, I really didn't know him like I should. I hadn't seen him. The right hand of the Father. I, haven't, I wasn't holding the head as I should. I didn't know I was the body. Part of the body. I didn't know the responsibility I had to be an expression of Christ. I thought if I just stayed busy and worked for him. Witnessed. That was it. The service comes out of communion. The service comes out of knowing him. That way there's no sweat. Because in the Holy of Holies, the priest couldn't wear anything that caused sweat. And the Lord will not allow sweat in his presence. And God had to shut me down to wipe all the sweat off my brow. And about uh, a year ago, I started having 
the Holy Spirit lift me out of myself into the heavenlies on one occasion for five hours a little prayer house just shut in with God he took me out in the spirit in a worship stream of worship and I was racing through the universe past the cosmos and the stars and I turned to see the earth and it was just a speck in space and I could feel the emptiness and the coldness because I was racing toward the judgment seat and the Bible said on the judgment day there'll be no place to stand and I had no place to stand and that's going to be the the most awesome thing that you have no ground to stand on except what you know of him and the intimacy you have with him you'd better know him when you go when that door opens you're not to be afraid of the judgment seat of Christ that's the moment of glory when he puts his arms around you I I've over the lifetime I've heard preachers so condemn me about the judgment seat of Christ Oh, no, no, when you're under the blood and intimate with him, shouldn't that be the time if you know him that you walk in, he puts his arms around you saying, well done, good and faithful servant. The only works that are going to burn, we're all going to have some works that burn. And that was trying to be righteous through our own works. That's all he's talking about. But that's a time of rejoicing. And I was racing past the stars and the earth was just a speck in space. And I thought, oh God, that's everything that I hold dear is on that speck and soon it's going to vanish. It's just a speck in space. All my ministry, all that I've done over the years, my family, everything I've held dear, every material thing, it's there. And suddenly it was vanishing. It's all going to be gone. And I'm going to be standing before Jesus. And you'd better know Him. You'd better be in union with Him because there's nothing left. Nothing. No, I began to, my heart began to rejoice. And I began to scream, Oh God, I have nothing. I've done nothing. Oh, thank God I know you. Oh, if I had known him, there would have been an emptiness in my heart. And suddenly I was detached, split free from the world and in his presence. And then a few months ago, I was in Dallas preaching. I just finished and I just raised my hands and there was a beautiful spirit of worship. And I remember just saying glory, honor and praise, glory and honor and praise, glory and honor and praise. And suddenly I was caught in a stream because you see, praise is an eternal stream. And when you worship and pray in the spirit, you're caught in the same stream. You're in that stream of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob with Peter and Paul and the apostles in the early church, the day of Pentecost. It's one endless stream. It's one circle of praise and you're caught up in that circle. You're one. There's only one hallelujah last through eternity. You're caught in that one great hallelujah of praise. And I was swept away in a stream and I felt my body just leaving the earth. And I felt myself going closer and closer and suddenly I saw a light break through and I passed out. I just went out. I don't know how long it felt, maybe 20 minutes or so. I was in the presence of Jesus Christ. Most awesome thing I've ever experienced in my life. And you know, I've heard people say, will we know each other in heaven? That's a mute question. It doesn't mean a thing because you won't want to know anybody else. You won't want to see streets of gold. You won't want to see mansions. You won't even want to talk to Peter or Paul because in his presence is fullness, joy, and pleasures forevermore. And Christ was so all-encompassing. He was so glorious. He so filled the heart with ecstasy. I didn't want to see family. I wasn't thinking of wife or unsaved loved ones. My father who'd passed on. Christ was everything. He filled my mind. And you know, when you get to heaven, it's not an even static kind of ecstasy. It's an ever expanded consciousness. Because when I got there into his presence, I didn't see his face, but the light. I became luminous. His light went right through me and his light went through me. I became one with that light. I was in the very presence of the light of the universe. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. No fear and the glory and the ecstasy got higher and higher and higher and you understand that all through eternity it's not static it's not level but the glory of Christ and the revelation of who he is is ever expanding he's going to expand our consciousness and all through eternity we're going to learn more and more of his glory and his grace and we're going to get more glory as the as the eons go by hallelujah the ecstasy and the glory of being in his presence nothing else mattered Christ was all in it all and if you see that you're in heaven long before you go there. 
And if you don't have a heaven in you now, <laughs> you can forget it. You, the saints used to call it a little glory to go to glory in. I'm in heaven now. I'm in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus by faith. I'm seated at the right hand of the Father. Hallelujah. In the words I administer you now, there are life. There are life because there are His words from Christ Himself because He said He is all glory. He is all honor. He is all praise. And when you are there, nothing else matters. Shouldn't that be the way it is now? Shouldn't He be all supreme? Shouldn't He be the center of our attraction? Should we not our hearts be going out to Him? Shouldn't we hear the cry of the bride? Come, come, come! The bride and the spirit say, come. Shouldn't our hearts be going out to him? Shouldn't we be like Peter jumping out of the boat wanting to be with him? Shouldn't we be like Mary whose heart couldn't be consoled until she had her heart satisfied that he was alive? If you really love him, your heart's not going to be satisfied until you know him in his fullness. Hallelujah. You, you know... I've got to just say this before I close. If you're his bride, Christ has to be able to say to you, there's my friend. There's my friend. That's my bride. There's my affection. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. The scripture says, he's the husband, we're the bride. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. I'm going to ask you that. Does he safely trust in you? Can he safely trust you that you're an expression of who he is now? In your ministry and what you're doing? Or is the flesh still in control? I don't know where he's taken me yet. But I don't want anything to do anymore with the secular ecclesiastical world. I don't want anything to do with it anymore. I want to see the new man risen. I want to be in that man. God only sees one man. The church is one man and that's Christ. And we in Him. And I'm hungry. And I told the Lord recently, if you think Jacob wrestled, you haven't seen anything yet. And the one thing we're not giving Him is time. How sad to preach in some of the biggest churches in America and have a pastor tell you he hasn't prayed in one year. To see men building buildings and body counts and ego tripping and it sounds like we don't even know him anymore. We don't know him. And we're so blind. So blind. My people have ears but they don't hear. They have eyes, but they don't see, and their hearts are cold. You know, there were some things that Jesus said, even to the disciples, there's some things I'd like to show you, but you can't, you can't accept it, you can't understand, you can't comprehend. And I think it'd be a shame that we'd stand before God and He'd say, there's some things I wanted to show you, but you weren't ready. I don't want that. I don't even want power. I want His love. And I want Him. If I never see him do another thing, if he never answers another prayer, I don't care. I know he does the miraculous, and I believe we need that. Oh, yes, I do. And I believe he'll answer prayer, but that's not why I love him. I love him because I've seen him, and I've tasted of him. I just buried my business manager, 33 years old, cancer of the liver. In the last two weeks before he died, I was with him every day. And all we did was talk about the glory. And Christ was revealing himself. And that young man at 33 saw more of Jesus than any evangelist I know in America. And he had preachers coming in and saying, where's your faith? You know, where's the sin in your life? And all that garbage. And he said to me, David, if God heals me now, I'll be disappointed. Because I've touched the glory and I want to go to it. And when you've seen the glory, the world doesn't hold attraction anymore. 
And if you don't have what Paul right now had, a desire to be with him rather than be here, your number one desire should be with him. You know, there's, a, there's an old cliche, so heavenly you're no earthly good. Well, there's no such thing. The man who said that was backslidden. There's no such thing as being so heavenly you're no earthly good. There is such a thing as being so earthly you're no heavenly good. No, no, no. I wonder tonight, how many of you have hunger? You sit here tonight, do you feel what I feel? Lord, I've known you all these years, but I really haven't known you like I want to. Lord, I've been right on the edge, but I know there's more. I'm not satisfied. Lord, the world can go this way, but I'm going to your heart. Let them have the buildings. Let them have the projects. Let them have the pro I'm going to you. I want your heart. I want a revelation. I want to know you. Hmm. Does your heart burn? Before I'm finished, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. The Holy Spirit's laid this on my heart. I want everybody that is under the blood of Christ to enter into the joy of acceptance, to fully accept your acceptance before Him, to come into the blessedness of sins forgiven, that you cannot focus on your sins now, but on the heavenly man in Christ Jesus. I want you to enter into that now. All Some of you lack the victory of that. You haven't been an expression of the acceptance and the glory of the cross. God wants that tonight. God wants you to enter the glory of your acceptance. That you're totally accepted in the beloved. It's in Christ. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flow, lose all their guilt and stain. The guilt and the stain is gone. We're in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus. The fountain's filled with blood. Accept your forgiveness. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. If you really believe that you have no guilt and stain and that you're clear before God right now, you would rejoice like you've never rejoiced. There'd be a joy in your heart. I'm under the blood. I'm accepted in the beloved. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm accepted by you, cleansed by your blood. Hallelujah. Nothing between, nothing between my Lord and my Savior. Under the blood of Jesus, under the blood, accepted in the beloved, rejoicing in his beloved, rejoicing, rejoicing, rejoicing in you, Lord. Rejoicing in you, Lord. Hallelujah. For I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. I have come not to condemn the world, but the world through me might be saved. Have I not promised to pour on you the oil of gladness and the joy of forgiveness? Stand on the glory of his name. Stand on his finished work. No devil, no power on heaven or earth can separate you from his. God's grief over his people. Heavenly Father, I want you to speak to us this morning. I want you to talk to me. I want you to talk to all of us about your grief over us. Hallelujah. Amen. Before I start, uh, when I was uh, at Swaggart Sunday night, uh, a group called the Singing Rambos did the music. Uh, Reba Rambo and her husband. And uh, we went out to eat after. And they began to testify how their life had been so changed last week by a miracle. They have a lady friend in California who is dying of cancer, terminal cancer. And it's her third operation. She's lost her hair three times. And she's terminal. And she prayed, Lord, before I die, I want to see you. I want you to come to my room. I want you to talk to me. I want you to meet me. And the Lord, through prayer, appeared to her. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared in her room. And her hands were so cold, he was just massaging her hand and said, Dearest, come with me. And took her on a four-hour journey over green pastures and over still waters as far as the eye could see and then sat beside a still water and green pastures and began to unburden his heart to her. Her name was Lucy, and he said, Lucy, I'm a bridegroom, and the reason I want a bride is because I need love. I need to be loved just as sure as you need to be loved. 
And he, with tears in his eyes, he said, I'm wearied of my bride. I'm wearied of my bride. My bride is careless. My bride doesn't love me anymore. They talk about loving me, but my bride doesn't love me anymore. And I'll tell you, she, uh, the Lord spoke to her and said, I'm going to give you a little more time. And I'm going to linger in your room with my presence and touch everybody who comes in your room to hear this message. And their life will be changed. And I want this message to spread. Your pastor and everyone who comes in the room. And the glow of the Lord after seven days is still in that room. Doctors, nurses, everyone are trying to get into that room. Rambo said when we walked in that room, suddenly it was revealed to us how shallow our lives are. And we were convicted and stirred. She just lays in the bed with that glow on her face and tells everybody in the room, Jesus is weary of his bride. Get ready, get prepared, begin to love him. The pastor was moved, stood in the pulpit and told about it. And now all over Southern California, that word is spreading. And one woman who has seen Christ and in the same message, when they were saying that, that witnessed to me. Oh, that witnessed to me. Jesus says, I'm wearied of my bride. And I was praying last night and the Lord gave me a message. God's grief over his bride. God's grief over his people. Now, you know the final outcome of the church of Jesus Christ is one of victory. You know the final outcome is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That's the final outcome. There's nothing going to change that. That's final. God is going to be victorious in the end. But in the meantime, remember the flood that Satan sent out against the angel for a season prevailed against the woman in the wilderness? Now, I want to talk about this this morning. We're supposed to be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed and secured by the blood. But anybody with any spiritual discernment at all know that the church of Jesus Christ is not where it should be. We all know it. And there is not a word, there's not a person here that doesn't discern it. Satan is trampling over God's people almost at will. Gwen and I read thousands of letters. Gwen reads eight and ten hours a day of letters coming from all over the United States. Some of you that are on our staff right now know what's happened. We sent out a prayer request letter, a sheet, where people could just request prayer. And how many, I don't know, we probably had four to 5,000 just last week. And the first few days, over 100 of them from women whose husbands, Christian husbands are leaving them. Broken homes. And Gwen and I, uh, uh, I'll be studying and I'll be in prayer. And she said, honey, please listen to this. And she begins to pour it out. Here's a minister, somebody of God's minister. His wife has just run off with another man. Left him with two children. He's about to give up his ministry. You, you, here, here are grandparents saying, my grandchildren don't talk to me anymore. They're supposed to be Christian. Here's a letter from a pastor from New York. It says, in New Jersey... Uh, a group that used to be connected with uh, a printing company, Charismatic. They began to have these choreo choreographer dances in the church. Now they've moved into ballroom dancing in the church, the sector and music, and bringing bands in. And he said, then they sing and shout and talk in tongues, and then Saturday nights are having their, their ballroom dancing. And now it's sweeping all through the East Coast. And, and you, you get letters and you read these things and you see Satan trampling over God's house at will. Just walking over his people. Walking at will. And, and you, there's, you go to prayer and there's a holy indignity comes upon you. And you say, Lord, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Children rebelling and backsliding, chaos in the homes. It was for a while just... Husbands leaving wives, but now wives leaving husbands. The backsliding is so widespread. It's a pandemic thing that's happening. Backsliding beyond anything this nation has ever seen. All across America, there, around the world, there are probably over 350, maybe 400 teen challenge centers taking in drug addicts and alcoholics. And all of our people are on their knees seeking God because of the widespread backsliding. Many have been converts who walked through the program and now backsliding, turning their back on the Lord. And we detect in these letters a sense of helplessness. So many people giving up hope and a loss of joy and victory in their lives. 
a sense of being defeated and cast down, defenseless, trodden down and wearied and troubled in mind. And there's something in me that says, Lord, why is the devil wreaking such havoc among God's people? And my grief, I believe, only reflects a little bit of the grief of God over the pitiful condition of the life and the homes of God's people. God does grieve over his people. He grieved for 40 years over Israel. Listen to it. But with whom was he grieved for 40 years? God was what? He was grieved. Don't tell me God doesn't grieve. He said, with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was he not grieved with them that sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And this is an amazing thing. This is the people God promised to carry like a father carries a son in his arms. He said, I'll carry you in my arms. I'll take you through the... Red Sea, I'll take you through the wilderness, and I'll plant you in a good land. He promised to be their guide, their keeper, their shelter, their strong arm. And I've just written down some of the things I've found in the Old Testament. He said, I'll be your covert from every storm. I'll be your deliverer from every enemy. I'll be your high tower of protection. He said, no weapons formed against you shall prosper. I'll keep you as the apple of my eye, the delight of my soul, the object of my tender loving care. Your enemies will be your footstool. You will be not just conqueror, but more than conqueror. And listen to this, what God is saying. I'll carry you like a father carries his son. No enemy shall prosper against you. I'll make you victorious in all things. I'll make every enemy your footstool. And had they only believed that, they would have lived a life of victory and joy, and they would have moved into a promised land and had victory all their lifetime. Had they simply believed his promises and rested in his mighty power, they would have been an invincible people. They could have walked through that perilous wilderness well fed, without thirst, without fear or despair, with every need supplied, with a song in their heart and great joy. They could have lived a life of peace and rest and victory and moved into a land of promise. And every tear would have been wiped away. Now that was God's plan. Why would God take a people out of the brick kills of Egypt? Why would he move them through the Red Sea? Why would he allow them to go through all this but to prepare them a good land? God never intended we live like we do. Never. That's never been God's plan. It's been unbelief that destroyed the whole plan of God in Israel. Unbelief blinded the eyes of the people toward the ways of God. They missed God's plan simply because they would not believe his word is true. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not... So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now, it wasn't just their lust that kept them out. It wasn't just dancing around the golden calf. It wasn't because they were neighing after each other's wives. It was beyond that. You see, God was forgiving to their sins. He had a Passover lamb, and our Savior was always, he's been merciful and forgiving to our sins. It wasn't just lust. It was something beyond that. It's the one thing that God sees in all of us far beyond lust, far beyond all of these petty things of the flesh. Oh, there was no problem with David finding forgiveness. Forgiveness is not the problem. It's our unbelief. It's our lack of confidence, our lack of trust in the Lord. It was this blatant unbelief that tied God's hands so he could no longer help them. He could no longer deliver Israel. Unbelief robbed them of every promise God made to them. It closed the door of fullness and joy. They began to even doubt that God loved them, that God was involved in their life. They questioned his mercy. And they began to turn inward to help themselves. And we look over, you know, I was looking over yesterday the pitiful history of Israel in this wilderness and I say to myself, and I, I stood to my feet, and I was walking around. Uh, I have a room up top of my garage. And I'm walking around there in the presence of the Lord. Every time I walk in, I meet him there. And I was looking at this, and I said, oh, God, what a waste. What a waste. Only Joshua and Caleb and Moses. Only three remained true of that whole tribe of Israel. What it could have been if they would have simply believed God. They didn't have to live in bondage. They didn't have to live in fear and trouble. That was all self-inflicted.
they could have chosen God's way. They are wasted in the wilderness, God forsaken, because of nothing short of unbelief. God grieves even more over this generation because of our unbelief, because we have better promises than Israel had, and we still be believe not. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you seem to come short of it. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fail after the same example of unbelief. And there you have it. Think for a moment of God's grief when he sees what's happening to American Christian homes in our lives. When he says, Israel didn't have an example like you have, they couldn't pick up a Bible, they couldn't pick up a testimony and learn of a people that could have had everything and backslid because of unbelief. They don't have an example, but you have an example, he says. We have an example of what happens to a people who won't believe God's word. And he said, are you going to fail after the same example of unbelief as Israel? And that's what God said to me yesterday, David, do you believe me? When you come into the presence of the Lord and you make your petitions known, do you believe that King Jesus at that very moment hears you? The eyes of the Lord and the righteous and his ears open to their prayer. Do you believe that God is at work that very moment? I was praying at that particular time when God was speaking that to my heart about my son and uh, pastor's uh, primarily black church in Detroit. He's about 26 years old and I, I pray for him night and day because of the powers of Satan all around that wicked city. And, and the physical harm and danger all around. And I prayed for him and God said, do you believe that while I'm praying right now that I am at work in your boy's life and in his church, that right now while you pray, I've dispatched an army of angels and I'm at work. you believe it? And I said, yes, I do. We have a house for sale. We used to live in a big house and we just said we can't live there anymore so we had it up for sale. It's been there for a year. And I've been praying about the Lord said, you believe I'm able to raise up a stone and turn it into a buyer? Yes. Because he can make the stones rise up and praise him. And the Lord said, if you believe I can make a stone into a buyer, I'll give you a buyer. You have to believe that. Do you believe? Do you believe his word? Do you believe when he said, ask and you shall receive? Do you believe he means that? Hmm. Very few of us believe it. Very few of us live it. God saying it should be different now. You've got my promise to bring you into a place of perfect peace and rest if you only believe. You've got the example here of Israel of what happened to them. <sighs> detailed. Look at it. It's all detailed. Go and read it. Read it once again and, and picture yourself and say, here, here it is. I have this example. And yet I'm doing the same stupid things they did. I'm not believing just like they didn't. God says, listen, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We have a high priest now, not like Israel. We have a high priest that's passed into the heavens. We have a high priest that's seated behind, beside the right hand of God. We have a high priest that's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And while I'm talking to you right now, he is touched with the feeling of everything you and I are going through. He's touched with it. He knows it. And he said, you have something better than they did. They had priests that died. They had priests that couldn't feel. They had priests that couldn't read their mind. You have a high priest who's ascended to the Father and he's seated at the right hand of the, of the Father. He's seated on his kingly throne. He's not only king, he's an assessor, he's high priest. And he says, come to this high priest, come to him in full confidence. Come to him to receive mercy and grace to help in your time of need. Yet we act like we have no king. We act like we've been abandoned. We go into God's presence and like beggars, we go into him like he's uh, somebody just floating around in his spirit. We've got to wake him up to get his attention. No. He says, do you believe me? Do you trust me? Why do you pray? Why do you talk to me if you don't believe that I'm going to answer? Why do you talk? Why do you worship me if you don't believe that I'm real? And so often we bind God's hands. We bind him. It was so when Jesus walked in the flesh, he went to his own country. The scripture said among his own people and listen to this. 
and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, listen to that. They tied the hands of Almighty God. God couldn't work. God couldn't work in Israel because of unbelief. Jesus, the Son of God, the miracle worker could do no mighty works in their midst because of their unbelief. And we tie his hands the same way. We tie him up. You know, Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he cried, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would. He kept saying, I would. I would have gathered you as a mother. And gathered you. I would, but you would not. And you hear it all through. I would, but you wouldn't. I would, but you wouldn't. I hear that all through the Bible. Every time I read it now, I'm more willing to give than you ought to receive. I'll do it. I will. I'm willing. I'm willing. But you're not. Your unbelief has tied me. Your unbelief stands, hinders me from doing what I need to do. In these last days, those who have not learned to trust the Lord in everything are going to be consumed when the troubles really begin to flow. All the Israelites who come out of Egypt except Joshua and Caleb are consumed in this terrible wilderness. Before he died, Moses told them why God was going to leave them alone. Moses predicted, he prophesied, he said, you're all going to die in this terrible wilderness. You're going to die here. You're going to die miserable lives. And then he told them why. He said, God promised to fight your battles. He bore thee in his arms as a man doth bear his son. Yet all, after all this, you did not believe the Lord your God. Let me read it to you again. This is Deuteronomy 1, 30 and 32. Listen. God promised to fight your battles. He bore you in his arms as a man that bear his son. Yet all after all of this, you did not believe the Lord your God. And then Moses said, And the Lord heard the voice of your words. And he was angry. And he swore, saying, Surely these shall, there shall not one of this evil generation see that good land. Turn you and take your journey back into the wilderness. Go not up, neither fight, for I'm not among you anymore. The Lord will not hearken or give ear to you anymore. Oh, that's powerful. That's frightening. God's saying to his children, go back. Die in the wilderness because you don't believe me. I tried to bear you. I tried to walk with you. I made your promises and you won't believe me. And I heard your thoughts because our thoughts are words. I heard what you were thinking. I, I can tell when my wife's thinking. I said, honey, come on, get it out. I know what you're thinking. And she said, I'm not thinking anybody. If I'll just wait long enough and press in, it'll come out. And the Lord says, I know what you're thinking. And you know, we, we, we get the idea, well, well, Lord, we're just human, we're just frail, and you, you, you don't mind these feeding thoughts of doubt and unbelief. And God says, no, I heard you. I heard your words. I heard what you said in your tent. I heard what you said in your room. I heard what you said in the imagination of your heart. And I was angry by what you said. And because you've said in your heart that I'm not with you, because you questioned me, go back into your wilderness. Go back. And I'm not going with you anymore. I'll not hear you anymore. Because the more I talk to you, the more I promise you, the less you love me, the less you believe me. All sense of God, beware of the language of your heart. Beware of the language of your mind. Do you really believe that when he said, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him? you believe that? Do you believe that this past week when the devil came against you like a flood, that the Spirit of the Lord was right there at work, though you didn't see him, raising up a standard, his holy standard? Or were you saying, God, where are you? Why did this happen? Are you throwing him a bundle of questions? Now, it's a great evil in the eyes of the Lord to speak doubt about his love or care for you. I want you to listen to this. Isaiah, now, just, just look at me. Give me your good eye because I want to share something from my heart. Isaiah said, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions. Now listen. Who is he talking about? Lift up your trumpet, blow the horn, show my people their transgressions. Now this, this blew my mind when I saw it. I'm speaking from Isaiah, the 58th chapter. Now here, here's the, here's the tragedy. He's talking to a people who love to seek God. He's not talking to prostitutes. He's not talking to alcoholics. 
He's not even talking to backslidden Christians. He's talking to those who are supposed to be on fire for God. Listen to it. Amazingly, he said, he's talking to those, and this is in Isaiah 51, 2. He's speaking to those who sought the Lord daily, who delighted to know his ways. Listen to it. He said, he's speaking to those who sought the Lord daily, who delighted to know his ways, who did righteously, who forsook not the ordinances of their God, and took delight in poaching to the Lord. They took delight in poaching to God. They delighted to go to prayer. They loved God. And yet he's saying to them, show them their transgressions. Show them their sin. And I say to myself, oh God, how do you show people sin who are beginning to seek you with all their heart and mind and soul and strength and they're saying, oh God, stir me. And they delight to pray. They love God. They delight in his presence. And here's the prophet Isaiah is saying, go tell them their transgressions. Show them their sins. And what is the sin? Huh? Here's the very best, the very chosen of God. And yet they're guilty of a grievous sin. And it's a sin of unbelief. And you find it in the third verse. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Here are people of praying. Here are people delighting in seeking the Lord. And yet when they go home, yet there's something over and above it all that's saying, maybe this doesn't pay. Where is the sign? Where's the evidence of his working in my life? They're saying, and, and they're listening to the lies of the devil. The devil came in. This is why this message is so important to me because I've just experienced this. I've just gone through it. And the Lord showed me my transgression. Showed me that my last idol was not television. It was nothing else but unbelief. Unbelief. It's an idol in all of us. Listen to me now. and Listen good. God showed me my unbelief. Because during that time, I was listening to these subtle little things. You know, the biggest lie the devil will tell you in that is that God's grace is so great and so mighty you can do almost anything and be forgiven. He'll turn the grace of God into lasciviousness right before your eyes. And I'll tell you what it did to me. For some reason or other, I picked up Luther's book on Galatians. And I'm reading there, and Martin Luther is saying, God's grace is so great that your sin is no longer sin in his eyes. And the old devil says, that's Martin Luther. And he's saying... God's grace is so great and the Lord is so forgiving that even though you sin, it's not sin in his eyes anymore. It's a lie, but it's a subtle thing. And, and suddenly the devil says, see, who are you? Who are you to live such a straight life and preach such a doctrine of holiness? Who are you? When the mighty Martin Luther, and you, you know, the sense is, well, just ease up. Just ease up. And that's when the unbelief begins to flood in. And say, oh, you know, others are praising the Lord. Others are being filled with the Holy Ghost and they're living, having fun. Now, that's not what I want. I don't want the fun. I've turned my back on all of that. But it's the devil coming and said, go ahead and write your book. Nobody's going to listen. They're going to make fun of you. Why make a fool out of yourself? And that's the way it's going to be for you. you, you the devil will come to you and say, hey, you started to seek God with all your heart. You've given him everything now. Some of you have thrown out your television set because you know it's an idol. You know it's the power of the devil's behind it now. And you're cleaning up your lives and you're seeking God. And then the enemy will come in like a flood and say it doesn't pay. What foolishness. Some of you that are working over here for last days. You work 18 hours a day. And the devil come to you lay down so tight at night and say you're a fool. You're crazy. Go out and make money. And he'll lie to you. And that's what he's, that's, that's what these dear people were saying, even though they delighted to come into the presence of the Lord. Suddenly this thought came to them, why am I fasting? I don't see evidence. God's not answering my prayer. Where's the evidence? God show me. I'm seeking your face night and day and I'm praying and I know I'm a man of God. I know I'm a woman of God. But where's the answer? Things are not changing. Show me the evidence. And the devil will make you demand evidence from God. He'll say, if you're a man of God, if you're a praying woman and you believe the prayer works, where's the evidence? 
Oh, thank God that scripture said, Blessed is he who sees not and yet believes. Hallelujah. Now I told God I'll believe him now. I don't care if I see. I don't care if God ever answers prayer again for me. I still believe him. I trust him. It doesn't depend on him answering my prayer anymore. I believe he answers prayer. But I don't have to see that to trust him. Glory be to his matchless name. He'll whisper, it doesn't pay to be so holy and sober and pure. No miracles in your life. Why do you bother? You're just like you were. You're just as cold as ever. You're the same old person you always were. Your troubles and problems are piling up on you. Your fasting doesn't get results. Relax! Let me tell you something. That, that's, let me tell you the three big lies of the devil right now. Number one, don't judge. And be, behind that, the devil can hide behind that smoke screen and do anything he wants to do. Well, we'd better judge righteous judgment. Peter or Paul judged Peter for being carried away. Jesus judged. Oh, did he judge? He called them vipers and snakes. And we'd better have a holy wrath of God in our hearts. Don't judge. And the other is legalism. Every time, we been, Brother Raymond have been talking about it, every time God speaks his word of separation, here comes not the sinners, but the preachers. Legalism. You know, I was down at Freddie Garcia's, our drug addict churches down in uh, San Antonio last week. You know, you, you get 600 of those converted drug addicts together, and you've got a meeting. <laughs> and a hundred of them are pastors that are on fire for God. And I was sharing this chapter about getting rid of your television idol. Because I've been listening to all those young preachers get up and preach like a house of fire. And then I looked at their pot bellies and I knew what they're doing. They're sitting for three and four hours in front of TV and junk food and getting fat. And, and, oh, did I lose? Okay. And uh, so I shared, I gave 31 reasons from the Bible, 31 scriptures why we're to get that abomination out of our house. Set no wicked thing before our eyes. Quit sitting in the seat of the scornful. Thou shalt bring no abomination into thy house. Thou hate it, detest it, lest you become a curse like it. And I'll tell you, the Spirit of the Lord moved. One preacher jumped up and ran, got in his car, ran out and smashed the two TV sets and came back. <laughs> now, in my book, I'm suggesting don't do it in public. Now, we shot some 20, we shot $6,000 worth of TV sets here. We shot them with shotguns. And everybody around here laughing about it in the neighborhood, but you know, it's changing now. Nobody's laughing because the Lord's beginning to speak about our separation from all that's of the world. So Freddie got up in his church Friday night. He, he told all his preachers, go home. I don't care if you have to, how far you go, get your sets. We're burning them all. But he called radio and television, all the cameras, something I didn't want to happen. And I picked it, oh, they're going to say, Dave Wilson told us to burn our TV sets and the book will be destroyed before it's out. But you know, the, all the television cameras and everything, it, it looks like they're going to burn over 300 sets before it's all over. And uh, they were, there was the, all the TV and it got on national news and they were smashing those TV sets. But you know, here's, here's the sad thing. The, the press carried it with dignity. And, and there was an awesomeness about it. And those hardened cameramen were saying it's about time. And the sinners were calling up. Their phones were ringing off the wall. Said, if we'd have known that, we'd have brought ours. The sinners. But the preachers in town were screaming, legalism! Legalism! Hmm? But Freddie, oh, I had one pastor after another. I'd sit there listening to their fiery sermons. And I'd have them come up to me later and said, Brother Wilkson, look at this. He said, I got up here and talked about going out winning souls on the street. And I'm sitting three and four hours in front of that thing. Losing my soul. I had a young Mexican pastor with me the other day, just pouring out his heart. He said, Bill Wilson, when I got saved from drugs, I was so on fire, so loving the Lord. He said, just like the rest, I sit down here because I call it relaxation. All idols start with relaxation. That's all they are, the relaxation. They're called diversions. And in this diversion, he said, I've lost everything. My heart went out to him. But you see, this thing, don't judge, and then legalism, and then the third one, and it's worst of all, the worst one. Relax! Relax. You, you go to California now, the reason I don't go to many churches anymore 
the, the drinking is so bad even in Assembly of God churches now. I was talking to Mark, one of our boys here, right front seat here. Mark is a contractor. You know, Mark was telling me in my house last night when he was hiring people out there, they, they, they said if, if, if you get drunk, you're finished. But the Christian contractors, they, they, they allow drinking and he, they were trying to get him to drink. Not the sinners, but the Christians were trying to get him to drink. The Christians were trying to get him drunk. And, and you go to our Pentecostal churches in the West Coast and many of our big cities, and the, congregate, the eyes in the congregation are full of lust, drinking. And like Mark said, they think it's cool now to curse curse, to take God's name in vain. You go to a church social now and they talk about their wine list. They talk about their material things. They talk about everything but Jesus. There was a time that we talked about his name. We glorified his name. And I'll tell you, folks, let me show you. Let me take you just a little further on this for just a minute. God, God is going to try, God is going to have to raise up a people who learn to cast all their cares on him. And if you don't learn to cast every care and trust him in everything, you're not going to be ready for what's coming. I want to, I want to find that scripture here for you. Uh, well, anyhow, it's, it, it's, uh, I think it's Jeremiah. He, he said, if, if you run with the footman and they worry you, if you get overheated running with the footman, what are you going to do in the horse race? And he said, if you are weary in a land of peace and security, what are you going to do when the Jordan swells? In other words, you and I are in a race, aren't we? But it's just a foot race. And if you're not trusting God now, in a land of peace and security where all is well and prosperous, what are you going to do when the economy crashes? What are you going to do when judgment begins to fall like a hammer, one after another? And the oil fields in Iran begin to burn, and the bombs are falling on the oil fields, and the whole nations and congressmen sit there stunned in silence because they don't know what's happening. And Reagan sits there in his desk, turning around, his face ashen white and pale, because he doesn't know what's happening, the suddenness, and the earthquakes begin to come as God's promise. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you can't eat? When you are running in a foot race and you're getting weary and tired and you're not trusting the Lord, how are you going to trust Him when all the apocalyptic horses of Revelation come racing down on this generation? What are you going to do then, he said? If you haven't learned to trust Him now when it all is well and peace and calm and all the day is coming, the day is coming that God's going to have a people and He's preparing them now while there's still a little time left. He's giving His little space and time to repent of his people to get ready and learn to trust him and cast every care on him and say, I believe, I believe he's going to walk me through the fire. And I can give you five promises that God's going to walk us through the fire. I'm going to take you by the hand and walk you through the fire. I don't know one thing. There's not a prophet in this Bible who thunders the word of God that doesn't preach his grace. There's not one that doesn't come with that message of hope for God's overcoming people. And the Lord's going to have an overcoming bride. He's getting it ready. We hear the sound of it all over America now. Preachers who are calling. They call Brother Raven Hill. He's got sometimes 15 a day coming over there. These are hungry men that come and say, like a, a preacher just dropped in here Friday, Joe, 500 miles. And he said, I, I'm not leaving until I talk to this man. And I, I tried to take him over to Raven Hills on Friday, but his house was full. So we turned around and came back, and he said, I, I'm so sick and tired, I'm a part of this. We've, our church been a, one of those, they're trying to get him into those satellite church. You know those crazy satellite church where you just, where you just sit there, and, and you let somebody do everything, and you become a cripple. Those are abomination in the eyes of God. That's out of the pits of hell. That's right. you and you know something? Good. Listen to me. With all my heart, I say to you, and I, I want this to get through. This man said, Brother Wilkerson, I've got people in my church that don't want to go on with God. They don't want to hear what God's doing in my heart. They want to just, they, they want to know why I'm not choreographing dancers up in front. 
They, they want to run out where there's noise. They want to run out where there's excitement. They want to run out where there's only miracles. But when I tell them that God's breaking my heart and I'm weeping between the porch and the altar now, he said, I've got even some of my deacons afraid to hear what God's doing in my heart. And the reason they're afraid, they're sitting in their lives and they're going to have to separate from it. Amen. And God's, he, he said, the truth is though, Brother Wilson, I've got a body of believers who are saying, Pastor, we've been praying for you. We've been waiting for this. And there's a handful only a handful. They're not going to, when the Bible talks about that mighty, that mighty host redeemed in robes of white, those are remnants from all generations. That's not just this last generation. They're going to be a remnant. They're going to be a handful, and it'll be a glorious. Listen, the only, God's pointing his spirit out all over America and around the world right now, and the people are responding to the bride. Because they're being awakened and stirred and seeking his heart and giving themselves wholly to the Lord. And I'll, I rejoice this morning that God is raising up a people finally. They're going to be able to look at any fury, look at any storm, look at anything and say, I'm in the palm of his hand. He warned me and I prepared my heart. I've been seeking his face. Now I'll fear no evil. He's got his hand on mine. He's going to walk me through whatever comes. And, it, and listen, if you think we're not going to suffer, you're wrong. We are going to suffer. There's going to be untold suffering. This idea God's just going to sweep you away and you're not going to have to do any suffering at all. I don't find that anywhere in my Bible. He's going to take us through what? He said, I'm going to save you in affliction. I'm going to save you in the middle of affliction. But he also said, the wrath of God upon the wicked is the mercy of God on the righteous. You know, I'm, 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 I'm prophesying America is going to be destroyed with hydrogen bombs. And, and I know the whole country is going to laugh. And the only people going to hear is the bride. But to me, a holocaust, what is a holocaust? Paul, Peter, the scripture says, if this outward body be dissolved, I've got another one. It just dissolves me into my new body. Hallelujah. Why should I be afraid? Why should I be afraid if bombs are going to fall in America? Because he's going to walk with us. Hallelujah. And some of us had better start disciplining ourselves. We better start seeking the Lord. We better start trusting him because we're just in a foot race now, but the red horses. You, you know, the Lord's already mounted all the horsemen. All the apocalyptic horses are already riding out of the chambers of the divine. And they're marching now, right now. I believe they're already in the firmament above this earth. And those trumpets. You know, Sister Basilia Schlink uh, is one of the great saints of America. It's a sisterhood of Lutheran uh, sisters. In, in Darmstadt, Germany, and about 15 years ago, I held a revival over there in Darmstadt with them. And Mother Basilia Slink's probably in her late 70s. And she'll spend eight months a year in a little house in Jerusalem just ministering to the Lord all by herself, just in prayer. And I wouldn't, I don't think I would know any other woman on the face of the earth that I would, I would trust the word more than this dear saint. And I got a call from Germany this past week from Sister Vasilia. She's written many great books. How this woman loves the Lord. She can spend 12 hours just saying, I love you, Jesus. And, and you get in her presence, there's just a glow on her face. I, when I ministered there, when Sister Vasilia Slick came in the room, I fell on my face for three hours. And I wept because I felt like such a sinner. And then they had a garden out there, and I couldn't even preach till I went out there and had a good long, laid out in the dirt, repented, because I was in the presence of a woman of God. And I got a call, and, and she sent me a tape. Some of us looked at it the other day. It's called Judgment by Fire. And she has seen the judgments of fire coming. She didn't know where. And I said, I believe it's America. And I, I've, I've been in touch now with probably seven of the most praying godly men on the face of the earth. Brother Ravenhill, there's a Brother Warnock up in Canada. The brother up in, uh, Brother Nelson, been praying, what, 20 years he's been on his knees. And these are men who pray night and day. They're at the altar with incense to the Lord. 
And they said, Brother Dave, I've, I've sent the manuscript. They said, Brother Dave, it should even be stronger. It's coming. It's coming. It's at the door. I, the Lord slew me in prayer. And he stood me on my feet in my room and I began to prophesy against the nation. Nobody in the room, just prophesying. And the word that came, the Redeemer's at the door. The Redeemer. Zion has come. Judgment is at the door. Let the redeemed of the Lord rejoice. Hallelujah. Judgment, no, to us it's glory. It's glory. Hallelujah. If you're afraid this morning, you better just get alone with him and say, Jesus, take out all the fear and the anxiety. And my message, look, I, I want to give you just the scripture too here. But let those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor will thou compass him as with the shield. Listen to this. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest us by thy right hand, them which put their trust in thee, from those that rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of thine eye. <laughs> Keep me under the shadow of thy wings. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Now, those that trust in him before the sons of men, thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from all strife. Oh, hallelujah. You believe that? Amen. He, they that put the trust in the Lord are going to be hidden from all the strife that's to come. Hidden in his presence. Oh, we'll have, we, there'll be some suffering, yeah. But we're hidden in his presence. He's going to walk with us. How great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which... Thank you.